Okay. Um, good morning and good afternoon and good evening. Uh, my name is Bill Keith. I'm Professor of Marketing at the College of New Jersey. Uh, and this is our third annual a virtual conference, uh, Multi-Level Marketing, the Consumer Protection Challenge. Uh, each year we've had uh, more than 650 registrants uh, from more than two dozen countries. Uh, we appreciate your interest and we think this interest indicates the relevance of our topic. Uh, just a few logistics issues. Uh, there will be two breaks and a lunch break. Uh, and as this year, we're doing a one day session. Um, we will have a brief Q&A at the end as much as time allows. Um, but go ahead and post your questions uh, and I will download them and we will try to uh, provide answers um, on the website afterward. Uh, be sure you reference the speaker to whom your question refers. Uh, so we're uh, very pleased that for the third year in a row, the um, uh, College of New Jersey School of Business has served as a sponsor. We very much appreciate that. The business school there is consistently uh, ranked in the top 100 for undergraduate business education. And the College of New Jersey, uh, their graduation rate is ninth in the country for publics. So we get students in, we get them out, and we get them jobs. Um, so uh, to do a greeting for us from the, uh, the College of New Jersey is Dean uh, Catherine Jervis. Catherine? Hi, how are you all? Welcome to the third annual multi-level conference, uh, marketing conference hosted by the College of New Jersey and Dr. William Keep, who just introduced yourself or himself to you. And he mentioned all the accolades of the College of New Jersey, but I have to mention that he served as the Dean here for nine years and then the Vice President of Academic Affairs and the Provost um, for two years before returning to us as a marketing professor. As you also know, he has been an expert witness for the government um, as, with respect to this topic, and he has many, many, many publications on the multi-level marketing um, issue. We're excited to welcome the participants here from two dozen countries virtually and in person for the first time that aims to improve consumer protection and reduce consumer harm within multi-level marketing. Today, you're going to hear from regulators, attorneys, social media, consumer advocates, researchers, educators, and journalists who are striving to educate the public about this issue. We are very excited to host this and to support Dr. William Keep in this, and we hope that you have a very enjoyable day. Thank you so much for a couple of minutes to speak to you this morning. Thank you, Catherine. Um, the, at this point, um, I would like to uh, ask uh, Doug Brooks to come up and say a few words of tribute to our colleague, uh, Bruce Craig. Doug? Uh, <clears throat> thanks, Bill, and, and thanks for your amazing work putting this conference together. I, I, I don't know how you do it. Um, some, of, uh, some of you will remember uh, Bruce Craig from uh, his appearances at the previous uh, MLM conferences uh, last year and the year before. Uh, Bruce passed away last year after a lifetime of advocacy on behalf of victims of uh, MLM. Um, I am lucky to have consider Bruce not just a colleague, but a friend and a mentor uh, uh, know, knew him for, for 25 years. Uh, Bruce worked, uh, he spent most of his career in the consumer fraud department at the uh, uh, Wisconsin Department of Justice. And he prosecuted many of the uh, prominent MLM companies like Holiday Magic, Coscott, Interplanetary, Best Line. Um, his work was cited uh, in uh, Senator Mondale's efforts to pass anti-pyramid scheme legislation in the uh, uh, Congress in, in the mid 70s. Um, <clears throat> he had a, he brought a case against Amway that was particularly uh, significant. He did something that I don't think anyone had ever done before or since. He got the tax returns for all of the uh, Amway direct distributors in the state of Wisconsin for 1979 and 1980. And he gave them to an expert 
And the expert analyzed them and submitted an affidavit in, in their case, uh, which said that um, <clears throat> the average Amway direct distributor had a net income of a negative uh, $918. Um, I'd, I'd love to see that done on a, on a broader scale. Um, after his retirement, Bruce continued to advocate for better laws and regulations of uh, MLM. He tirelessly contacted journalists, academics, politicians, regulators, trying to urge them to do the right thing. Uh, and he continued doing that until the day he died. I, I do have um, a, a note from uh, Andrea Craig, his, his widow. Um, and let me just read uh, some of this to you. <clears throat> she, she writes, for many in my generation, the 60s and 70s were years of passionate purpose, resulting, I would argue, in, in, in civil rights movements, the anti-war movement, Earth Day, women's rights and education, employment, health. And among these progresses, the introduction of consumer protection units for many state departments of justice around the country, including Wisconsin Justice, where Bruce worked. Uh, Bruce had come to understand that this business model, which at the end was based on powerful people recruiting vulnerable people to recruit other vulnerable people and down the line, that these recruits were consumers who needed protection and damn it, he was gonna try. And so it began. For Bruce, this became a mission until, until the day he died. Bruce longed for a society which reflected his beliefs, justice, compassion, government when needed. He was en enraged by injustice. He felt deep compassion for the victims of pyramid schemes the recruits, most of whom down the line of multi-level marketing businesses failed to make it and blamed themselves. Bruce also believed that the role of government protection for consumers extended to those who were deceived by pyramid schemes. And she quotes Bob Dylan, they were only pawns in their game. I hoped he would live to see the FTC reverse its momentous ruling in Amway where it essentially legitimized the predatory business model. I hope I will. With gratitude, I salute you who have worked so hard, who continue to press the case. May you succeed. And uh, thank you, Andrea. And thank you, Bill. Thank you, Doug. So our first session deals with some recent cases. And we have a number of people who have worked on these cases. And our first uh, a speaker will be uh, Dr. Peter Vandernat. Um, retired senior economist of the Federal Trade Commission. Uh, and uh, Peter will share with us um, some of his uh, insights from the case he worked on. Peter? Good morning. The case I worked on for the FEC is called SEC versus E.J. Dalius. And the theme of my case and talk, this case is important because it stands for, in my mind, the attempted eradication of the distinction between general consumers and MLM distributors. And this has been a long goal of the industry. I'll go into that a bit. And especially the expert report from Professor Ann T. Coughlin takes the position that there really is no distinction. I spoke to the SEC attorneys about her report and they assure me that her report is now a public document, so I may speak on it. <laughs> So uh, I could even pass it out, but I don't have multiple copies with me, but I will make some comments there. For this case, if you want to uh, have a great overview of this case, uh, the SEC 2019 amended complaint lays out the entire case. So if you want to learn about the fact of this case, and I give you their website, you just go to the website and it gives you a complete layout of all the kinds of stuff that took place in this case. So I'm going to click on this. Here we go. Here are a couple of press releases. The first one came out in October of 20, no, excuse me, November of 2018. I just read the first paragraph. The SEC alleges that Dalius, who pled guilty in 2001 to criminal charges in connection with a long distance card phone scam, and the companies he controlled on the umbrella name Savian or Savian, depending on how you want to say it, sold securities that entitled holders to receive 
20% cash back on their shopping purchase. That's the product of Savian right there. And what did you have to do to get that in exchange for paying a fee of $125 every 28 days by submitting your point of sale? So it's simple. That's the product right there. Okay. And Dalius and the Savian companies falsely claim, says the SEC, that the company funded its cashback memberships to members by monetizing the point of sale receipt data. There's a lot of point of sale receipt data. They said they could monetize it and that could fund the operation. The SEC says that's totally false. They satisfied the returns to some investors through the investment of others rather than through a legitimate business activity, okay? Then just last month, there is the latest release. It says that the case has been settled, okay? The resolution of the fraud action. And it says, Dalius and Savian, the company, agreed to pay approximately $24 million in disgorgement prejudgment interest penalties to settle all the claims. Dalius and Savian agreed to settle the charges without admitting or denying the SEC's allegations, which is the usual situation with settlement. That has problems of its own in my mind, but that's the nature of the settlement. Let's go to slide three. Okay, so a quick recap here. What is the company's product? It's a cashback membership, okay? And you get monthly cash rewards, 20%, but it's a maximum of $300 a month on various shopping purchases. What do you have to do? You have to pay a recurring fee and you have to submit your point of sale receipts, okay? Now, membership fees, 125, 125 every cycle of 28 days. The fee was charged up front on the day of joining. Then by the last day of any cycle, including the first, a account would be charged another 125 for the upcoming cycle. In fact, the company says in its documents and also at the website, as soon as your account accumulates 125, the system automatically deducts the next 28 days, right? So you, you're always in the system and you automatically pay your fees. And there's one price for all participants, right? It's 125 per cycle, whether the membership is sold to consumer with no interest in building a business, and, they, and these are also called retail customers in the company's documents, all right, rightly so. And whether it's sold to an affiliate, a person who buys a cashback membership and then sets out to enroll others on behalf of Sabian. And I think others will know that uh, this one price thing is very close to Vima, that, that in the Vima clay case, uh, you have the very same setup. And it obviously is to certain problems, especially when you have a pyramid scheme com uh, compensation plan. So slide four, here is the guts of the company's compensation plan. Here's the table. The compensation plan has 13 ranks in it, all right? And there are all the names. And uh, this document is in the company's documents. It was distributed to affiliates. You could get it at the company's website. So this was no secret. Uh, what do you have to do according to the compensation plan? Well, you have to pay the fee via automatic debit. What else do you have to do? you must directly in enroll three persons who buy the membership. Whether they're affiliates or not, they have to buy the membership. Three, then in order to get rewards, commissions per day, there are a specified number of total paid memberships in the affiliates downline. So for example, suppose you wanted to reach rank R5 two-star founder. You have to have your three personal direct enrollees, right? And you have to maintain them. If one drops out, of course, you have to replace because you must have three paying members, okay? Then in your downline, the total memberships of these um, cashback memberships have to be 150. And you have to maintain them. And for as long as you do, you are a two-star founder and you will then qualify for $100 a day, okay? That's a, a very attractive proposition if, if you could reach it, right? And if you reach the higher ranks, like R13, you get 3,000 per day, all right? So uh, lest you miss this point, the company has all kinds of slides, promotional slides to drive the point home. So yeah, you can see it, good, good. So look, for example, five-star founder, okay? It tells you you need a 750 team members, which is also on, on the table, all right? And if you look at the daily rate on an annual basis, that's more than $100,000 a year. Uh, a six-figure income, all right? 
Then it goes through all the ranks. I don't have them all here because it wouldn't all fit on one page. But I think you can see at the top, get three, uh, it's, 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 what, it's blocked out there. Way at the top there, if somebody could X that out, ring three and it's better than uh, free. And the idea was that when you enroll your personal three members, all right, and you look at what you get, all right, which is the $5 a day, the company makes a quick calculation in its promotional materials that says, look, you're going to get more on your rewards than what you're paying for your cycle. And it's true. I mean, on its face, you look, you, you do the arithmetic, you will get more in your daily rewards if you do the calculation just the right way than what you paid for your membership. And that's the meaning of ring three, and it's better than free. All right. So right from step one, the, the company is saying to you, also in its seminars, there is residual income here. And that residual income gets bigger and bigger and bigger as you move up the ladder to the higher levels. All right. And that's what this promotional thing is about. Well, there are certain problems here. Let me back this up. Oh, I have to back up. I'm too far. Someone help me back up. How do I? We have to get out of there. I have to get out. No, just back. I want to see my slide screen. Okay, well, we'll just go here. We'll just go. We'll let it go. All right. You see, when you have a table like this, where you have required recruitments of paid members, I mean, by all of case history and common logic, that's an inevitable pyramid scheme. I mean, you don't have to do a lot of, you don't have to be an expert in pyramid schemes to say, this is going to be a pyramid scheme, right? Because how do you make your money? Well, this is the only way you make your money. You've seen the table. That's, that's the way you make your money. What other way might you have made your money? Well, if you sold to retail customers and you had a markup on the price, you might have made a little money there. Right? There is no money to be made there. The only way you're going to make your money is through this table. All right. And therefore, you can compute mathematically the percentage of people who are not going to attain certain ranks because you have an ongoing flow of participants. That's what the company says. And if each enrolls three, that's called a geometric progression. And when you look at the properties of a geometric progression, which I briefly do, you can deduce the percentage of participants on a flow basis that never get beyond R2, that never get beyond R3. Now, the people involved in that flow are always different, but the proportion of people who never go beyond R2 stay safe, stays the same. It's 96% of the people never move beyond R2. And as I will point out, you have to be fairly up in that rank to even break even. At R2, you do not break even, okay? So, so it's a setup, right? And uh, what are the parts here? All right, I have a little echo. I don't know if you have the echo, but I have a small echo, all right? First, the company has no retail requirement. Oh, that's a, a real no-no if you have this kind of compensation scale, right? And there were all kinds of co uh, documents that I read where the company said, you did have a retail requirement. And it goes into it. And I made many computations. And then when I presented my first draft to the attorneys, they said, well, the company now maintains that those documents were never implemented. Okay. So they disavowed any retail uh, requirement. And I said, well, you know, on the one hand, that makes the government's job easier. If there is no retail requi uh, requirement, and retail customers and affiliates pay the same price, and the only thing you can do is meet the table, I mean, there's not a whole lot left to be said here, except to compute the percentages and say, who is not gonna make it here, all right? And so um, that's the second problem for these people. And in fact, although you didn't have to enroll retail affiliates, there's actually a disincentive to enroll them, right? There's actually a disincentive. Why? Because they're not required, and they're by definition people who don't help you build the downline. So if you put a retail affiliate, excuse me, a retail customer in your downline, well, that's a terminal point of your downline because that person does not generate new downline, and you're never going to get those deeper downlines with those 750 paid memberships if people aren't recruiting beneath you, right? So, so there's a disincentive to actually enroll any retail customers, all right? So. 
the predictable outcome is that when you look at the company's training seminars and what it taught and its compensation plan, right? Everything ensured that the affiliates would want to pursue the path that the company taught, which is in all of its seminars, also available at, at the website, enroll more affiliates. They help you build a downline. They help you reach those deeper levels in that table and look at the rewards per day that you're going to get. At some level, at some level, this is the easiest pyramid scheme case I've ever done. I've never had what on its face is a slam dunk pyramid scheme case, right? I mean, you don't have to be an expert to say that. <laughs> you, just, you just say, look, what else are you going to do? It gets worse. Once you join, you, you got hit with a surprise. The company at its own options will pay you in a company created script called passes. And each pass is worth $125, says the company. So when your account is credited, it can credit a number of passes into your account of $125. And if you were an affiliate, oftentimes the company would pay your, your cash back report, uh, rewards in passes. So it wasn't cash, but you had an account that had a nominal value, okay? What could you use your passes for? Well, you could give them back to, to Savian for your next cycle. They're worth 125. And a lot of people just said, okay, I'll just give them back to you for the next cycle. But you don't get any cash that way. You're just recycling this paper script, right? That's, I mean, that's all you're doing. And that was a lot of it. You're just re re recycling the script. The other thing you could do, at which the company advocated, you can sell the script to other participants. So if you're enrolling new people, you say, look, yeah, it's 125, but I can sell you a bunch of passes, who knows, for whatever price we negotiate. And so there was a negotiation, a whole sub-market in passes, where inevitably, if you wanted to sell your passes, you'd have to have a, sell them at a discount because who would buy it if you didn't give them a discount, right? And that's exactly what happened. In fact, under, de under deposition, some very high level participants testified, they had lots of passes, an account full of passes, but if they wanted to cash it out, they sold it at a discount to others. So that further reduced your business income from Sabian, right? The interesting point about that was, I didn't know that until I got deeply into the case because I read all the promotional materials, the compensation plan. There wasn't a word about passes. So when I wrote my first draft report, the passes weren't in there because I was analyzing the structure. And they said, well, but there are the passes. And then I had to get into the passes and it was nothing but a deep rabbit hole, <laughs> right? You can just see, and it makes it very hard to say, what did people actually earn from Savian? Who knows? Because the price between, of passes is a negotiated price between buyer and seller. So who really knows what they earn? And so therefore I said, what can I do? What you can do from the database is figure out what rank did a participant achieve, all right? When did they achieve it? What was the highest rank? And therefore you can empirically see the, all the empirical rankings. That's in the database with some work, but that's in the database. And I'll get to that slide. And from the math, you can have predicted failure rates, and then you can compare them to the empirical failure rates that you find in the company's data, all right? So, so look at, I use an optimal scenario in all of my cases in which people enroll other people. In this case, it's everybody enrolls three by company fiat, all right? And then you look at that ongoing flow, all right? And from the flow and mathematical computations, which I do at great length in my report, I won't do them here, uh, you can deduce the number of people who in that flow never go beyond R2, it's 96.3%. The people who never go beyond R3, 98.8% as an ongoing flow. Now the names are always different, but as the flow continues, that's the percentage and this is not just the percentage when the thing collapses, it's going to collapse. No, this is, an, uh, this is when you're looking at it at any point in time, all right? Any point in time. It's not like people lose money when it collapses. No, all along the way, when the thing, thing is working successfully in quotes, there are 98.8% who are not above rank three <laughs> at all times, all right? And, that, and, that, and that's the crunch point that you can show that mathematically. And that's simply a mathematical computation from a geometric progression and its mathematical properties. Okay. So on that same page, I have actually the first empirical table. There are some 
million IDs worldwide. That's a lot of IDs. There are numerous countries, hundreds of thousands just in the USA, but worldwide more than 3.2 million, right? But you could piece together the actual empirical rankings. Look at the rankings. Look at the people who, who reach R2 and no higher, 97.4%. It's highly consistent with. Now, this is not a slam dunk yet here because uh, the, the company had arguments, right? They said, well, there are all kinds of retail people at the bottom, rank null. They don't have a rank. Those are, those are the retail customers <laughs> maintain the company. And, but then you have to go back to the incentives. But the affiliates had no incentives to enroll retail customers. They didn't have to. In fact, they had a disincentive to enroll retail customers. Those would be terminal points in their downline. So you get into that kind of an argument, okay? So the whole problem is, how do you account for the 2.3 million people who have no rank, right? Well, part of it is, to be our founder, you had to enroll three people and maintain them. How about the ones who enrolled two people? One person who tried and enrolled zero. These are all affiliates, but they're all at rank zero because they didn't achieve rank one. So you get into all that kind of deeper debate and, and that's what you get into. And as in Dima, I believe, you know, the company said, well, those are the retail customers and the judge would have none of it. Because when you look at the incentives and say, why would they be retail customers? Can you even show any retail customers given the structure of the program? It's exactly the same problem here, right? But what I show in numerous tables, I have not just one table because I refined the tables for those who enrolled just one, et cetera, because the data shows if you enrolled one or more. And so I have numerous tables. And my conclusion is all of the tables are consistent with what the optimal scenario predicts. Not so surprising because the company forces the very pattern. In a lot of cases, the pattern is enforced. In this case, the pattern is forced. You look at the table, that's it. <laughs> that's what you gotta do, okay? So I was very interested to see what Professor Kuglin would do with this, all right? And in my opinion, if she was gonna defend this at all, she didn't have a whole lot of choice except what, what she did, all right? But she maintains overall in, in her report, that the affiliates are engaged in two distinguishable and, and per perhaps and indeed separable activities. They are pursuing the business opportunity, but they're also purchasing the cashback membership for its consumption value. And that's what makes them retail people. They're buying it for its consumption value, all right? She further maintains that the distinction between retail sales to affiliates versus retail sales is a meaningless criterion for pyramid scheme analysis. Now that one hit me hard. And then, and then she cites to me as making this terrible blunder. So, and I cite her, if you ever, ever look at her report, I cite the paragraphs where these things are said verbatim, all right? Because this is tricky to talk about a person's report and say, this is what they said. So I'm quoting the paragraphs where it is said, okay? Then she maintains, there was never any requirement to purchase Sabian products to pay the fees, to become and operate as an affiliate at any point in savings operation. She not, not only says that once, she says it numerous times. I say all the place, places where she says it, all right? And what's she cite to? Section 1.2 of savings policies and procedures, which in my mind, as I say in my report, is boilerplate language. No person is required to purchase any of savings products or services to pay any fee to become an independent representative. I think every policy and procedure I've ever read says that, which means in order just to sign up and sign up, I want to be an independent representative, that, that has no fee. That's always true. The question is, do you want to make any money at this thing? What do you have to do now? Okay. And in order to make some money, Savian says, we're going to debit your account every 28 days. Okay. For some reason, well, I, I won't go into it. Professor Coughlin largely ignores it or has her own take on it, all right? But she has a second reason as to why people never had to pay the fee and that, that, that therefore the payment of the fee was voluntary and it had to be for the consumption value of the product, okay? And she says, there was an option called affiliate only, also called free affiliate, where you could join and not pay a, a few minutes, okay, uh, and, and not pay the fee. So I looked at the database. Happily, that category is recognized in the database. 
and across more than 3 million IDs, one tenth of 1% had the status of pre affiliate or affiliate only, right? De minimis. And, and I ask, and I say in my report, why are there so few? Because when you read the company's rules and procedures, in fact, it's, it's compensation plan, it says an affiliate only in a person's downline does not count toward the rank advancement count for the upline. So who would ever want to enroll a free affiliate, right? So I say that's probably the main reason why, right? But whatever the reason, it's one-tenth of 1%. That could not possibly have any impact on the program. Amazingly, Professor Coughlin analyzes none of that data. Has, and she had my report where I said all these things in possession when she wrote hers. She analyzes none of it. In fact, all of my expected failure rates and my empirical failure rates, she never touches them. Doesn't say a word about them. She maintains that the, that the distributors did indeed want to pursue the business, but they bought the thing for its consumption value. Okay, in fact, next screen, I'm gonna go race past this. Uh, hmm. How do we do this? This just, it gives me trouble. I wanna exit out of this so I can do the um, screen. Well, let me just uh, say, Professor Kublin published an ebook with the DSA in 2022, okay? And the introduction to the book is written by Mr. Joe Mariano, the president of the DSA. Th th there it is. Okay, now let me get to this one. And he says, the legal analysis should be, is the product being used by real consumers? Whether the consumer is a distributor is immaterial. This is a quote, it's quoted in the Economist magazine uh, in an article called Pharaonic Creations, Pharaonic Pyramid, right? <laughs> That's their pun. And how to spot a pyramid scheme, all right? And her, her ebook uh, takes the same position. It's immaterial, okay? And she says that in her ebook and she says it in this particular expert report, okay? And in fact, she writes her own version of the Cascot test in her book. I have it in bold. An illegal pyramid scheme is characterized by a payment or consideration, all right? You make, you make some kind of payment and the right not only to sell the company's products, but to earn compensation, okay? Without regard to end users. And she defines end users to be either a distributor or a non-distributor. So she writes her, her irrelevant distinction right into the meaning it's irrelevant because in her very statement of the Cascot test, she's made it irrelevant, meaning they're both, they're both end users, okay? Her says, all right, it's totally contrary to case law. And if you want to look at the next one uh, is Burn Lounge. I invite you, look at the uh, Burn Lounge case. Burn Lounge is correct when participants bought packages for internal consumption and that they were ultimate users in, in that case, okay? And it's therefore not by that fact a pyramid scheme, but it's incorrect to conclude that all rewards paid on these sales were related to the sale of product to ultimate users. Whether the rewards are related to, the, to product depends on how the bonus structure operated in practice. That's exactly what it is in, in this case. How does it operate in practice, right? The rewards are paid not for consumer demand, they're paid for recruiting participants. And the, and the court said, that's why it's a pyramid scheme because Burn Lounge incentivized recruiting, not product sales. Every word of that applies to this case. That's all I've got to say. <laughs> Thank you, Peter. Yeah. And um, yeah. <laughs> our next speaker will be Dr. Stacy uh, Bosley. Um, yeah. Dr. Yeah. Bosley is associate professor at Hamlin University, holds a professor chair there. Um, and she will share with us some of her experience with, with the case. Okay, I think we are set. Okay, thank you so much for having me. And again, I just wanna um, give a special thanks to Bill Keep, who does so much work to make this happen. Um, and we're all very, very grateful. 
Um, and so I'm going to talk about two different cases today, uh, both cases uh, where I served as an expert for the Federal Trade Commission. And so I think we'll be able to see some similarities, some also unique aspects to each case, but similarities in particular in terms of the way that the, um, the incentive structure operates, the way the operational practices appear, and the way that uh, representations uh, become sort of integrated in uh, with the, the promotion of the structure itself. So the first case I'm going to talk about is um, FTC versus Advocare. Um, Advocare uh, was founded in 1993 and, um, you know, had a relatively, I would say, large brand footprint um, for, for a multi-level marketing firm with the Advocare Bowl and, uh, you know, uh, large endorsements like Drew Brees and um, had this line of supplement and health related products. Um, and uh, in 2019, a complaint was filed. And I'm going to first just show you again, sort of where the FTC ended up. Um, because again, I think that it was a, a, a a very uh, notable outcome. Um, so not only um, did the um, did there, you know, ultimately result in um, refunds to consumers? This was prior to the to the Supreme Court case, um, and so this, they were able to get 150 million dollars back for uh, nearly a quarter million consumers. Um, but in addition, um, had bans on multi level marketing for um, the company in particular, and including and also the CEO and some top level distributors. Uh, but the company persists today as a single level um, firm. And I think it's really interesting. You'll see a, sim a similar um, uh, data point for the other case that I'll talk about that it's really interesting to try to get any insight at all into what a company um, be you know, becomes or is when the reward structure is detached from the multi-level component. Um, and so Advocare, uh, again, does give us a little bit of window into that. And I'll, 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 it's, it's difficult to get um, perfect information as a private company on where they are today, but I'll give you some indication of that. Uh, and again, um, a finding of a, a, a pyramid scheme. Um, again, the re the refunds uh, came out uh, just this last year. So, in terms of structure, um, of course, you know when we think about structure, we have to think about both the written, um, you know, the words on the page, you know, how the compensation plan and and policies and procedures uh, identify structure, and also uh, the operational practices of the firm. How does this come to life in the words and trainings? of the, uh, the company and the uh, top distributors themselves. And so in um, Advocare, there was a relatively large buy-in. I know, of course, it wasn't like uh, the buy-in that we saw at maybe like LuLaRoe, but you know, there was a large buy-in of um, getting to advisor, which was the, uh, the absolute imperative for the new person. And that, that buy-in was about uh, $1,200 to $2,400 um, to kind of get started, right? So that was the, the get to advisor, um, but past that, there was, uh, again, an imperative to maintain uh, monthly volume in order to stay qualified for bonuses, of course, not, not a unique feature. Um, but, you know, the company's own CEO said, we don't have to worry about retail. If you, again, as you see here, if you package dirt right and put the points on it, uh, distributors will buy it. Um, and so they also had to requalify on an annual basis. And so there was a, a, a lot of this, um, you know, again, uh, incentivized uh, investment on the part of uh, uh, business opportunity participants. And then, of course, there was the strength of the link between profit and recruiting itself. So, uh, again, the, a, a lot of discussion of, you know, getting to advisor as fast as you could and then getting uh, as many people underneath you who would also do the same. Right. Um, and so, uh, again, building your foundation, then uh, watching it, you know, again, duplicating duplication, of course, will come up many times uh, in my talk today is it's a part of the the operational practices, right? How do we talk to people about um, replicating um, to we, to we, so that we can grow to explosion as described here. And one of the ways in which these two things came together, which again um, is, a, is not an, an, uh, an uncommon feature, is to tie the incentivized recruitment piece to the, the act of duplication. So, you know, what kind of blueprint can you create that others will replicate? And so, for example, here was a, a slide where if you started, you know, with $500 and other people um, who you then brought in, right, duplicated that action, the, the outcome for you would be uh, much poorer than if you were starting from a 
quote, sort of stronger position, right? And then um, creating that blueprint that others would follow. And so again, it sort of brings together, sort of uh, just uh, highlights the incentive for, for personal recruitment um, and also, uh, again, uh, personal investment that you then duplicate. And so again, this, uh, we can look at the words on the page and it's absolutely important to do a full analysis of the compensation structure and I uh, you know I do that in every case but again looking at the operation the operational practices again the words how does this come to life how do they train people in terms of you know what are the important things in operating this business we say we see words that that uh, emphasize the 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 minimal role of of selling here I'm selling stay-at-home mommies we sell freedom, we don't sell Spark, uh, one of the Advocare's uh, primary products. I was building a business the wrong way, right? I was retailing, I was going slow, other people were doing it the right way. They were getting the advisors in. The best thing we have is the opportunity, not the product. So if you, you know, if that's true, then, you know, it's like going to a steakhouse and ordering the cheese sticks, right? Um, and, you know, of course, just very direct um, statements that you will never earn significant money by retailing products. Now, uh, the company did adopt a preferred customer uh, category in um, 2017. And, uh, you know, of course, anytime a company has a preferred customer category, we have to look at the details of that. You know, what are the incentives to be a preferred customer versus a distributor? What is the what, what what is the role of that both in terms of the compensation structure? Um, what do you get paid on preferred customer volume? Um, but also sort of again these operational practices, right? What is the firm itself saying about the role of that piece? And as we can see here, uh, you know words like you know this is what we get on our way to finding business builders. You might get preferred customers, uh, but that's sort of right secondary and sort of happens uh, you know as sort of a. a a uh, fallback, mm -hmm. um, and also again that you might then be able to harvest a distributor down the road, right? If you bring them into the pipeline um, in this fashion, and so uh, again, as in any case, we have to look at you know what not just the existence of a preferred customer category, but how does it how is it rewarded, and how is it is it uh, integrated into their overall uh, incentive structure and operational practices. In terms of representations, um, you know, again, uh, a lot of self-determination, right? The, the sky is the limit, you are the variable, this is a proven system, uh, you know, you're the one who determines where you end up. Um, and again, uh, you know, tying together this uh, recruitment duplication with the result, right? You will build a staggering income if you follow this path of moving people to advisor and getting other people to do the same. When they did disclose numbers, they were um, heavily skewed by the, the, the you know, small share of high earners, but also by the omission of people who didn't earn at all, which we'll see in the outcomes was a very large share of the participants. And uh, furthermore, the distributors themselves, high level distributors created their own disclosure and this disclosure was heavily utilized and had, again, this element of self-determination. So pick your color. Here's uh, one image of this where it had the company level ranks, had them color coded um, compared to uh, alternate occupations. And then basically, you know, and sometimes literally said, pick, literally pick your color. Like, and, and here are some uh, a, a specific uh, quote, you know, point to a number and say you want to earn that and we'll teach you how to do it, right? So this is just your decision to make. And again, sometimes the uh, representations were, you know, implied or lifestyle claims, but sometimes they were incredibly explicit, right? Up to $50,000 a month, the sky is the limit here. We can show you how to get any outcome that you want. Now, in reality, uh, you know, I want to emphasize something that Dr. Vandernet said, um, the, the losses that you see in this type of structure are not unique to one point in time, they persist over the, the life of the firm. And in this case, we see that the loss profile was effectively the same over time, um, you know, three and four earning no revenue at all, for example, in 2016, this largely remained the same in 2017 after the preferred customer category was added. Uh, and again, if, if we think about any kind of expenses at all, here we're looking at, you know, nine and 10 earned less than $250 for the year. 
Uh, and so again, any expenses at all, and you're in a lost position there. Um, and so again, uh, while you know nine and ten in this case, for example, were were losing money, um, you know that didn't mean that Advocare wasn't benefiting from this structure, right? Uh, Two billion dollars being paid in product revenues from the distributors themselves, um, and you know again, so you know we can see that difference in in the incentives of the firm and the incentives of uh, or in the outcomes of the the low level distributors. So I'm just going to switch gears a little bit and talk about a um, more recent case, Success by Health. Um, there are some, as we'll see, some unique aspects to this case, but things that will, um, you know, we'll see echo uh, the, what we saw in Advocare. So this is, as you can see, this case was had uh, coffee as the primary product, mushroom infused um, coffee, which I understand is a thing. I've never tried it. In, um, but uh, this is... Um, Again, a unique case in certain ways, in that there was a uh, the the um, founder's name Jane was Jane named Jane Noland, sorry, and uh, he had a prior order from a prior um, situation, and so um, you know that that was a unique aspect. Um, there also were large um, well training sessions are not unique. Um, in this case, the amount that was paid for ancillary training was relatively high, a uh, large ticket, uh, if I recall correctly, you know, $900 event ticket purchases, things like that, that, uh, that were sold a lot alongside the, the business opportunity. Um, there was also the, the current products, which as I said, were mushroom infused coffee, hot chocolate, things like that, some other G drops. Um, but there was also this sort of future product that never did materialize of what was called Boz Travel. And um, so that was also sold at, at, at one stage in the in the case or in, in the, sorry, the life of the firm and, and, and never was a real product or, or service. Uh, but nevertheless, the company sold founders packs and earned revenue off of a in this case, non-existent product. Um, and again, one other thing that of course is not wholly unique, but maybe isn't uh, totally standard is that there was a temporary restraining order and preliminary injunctionary um, uh, that halted the operations of the firm um, and uh, as, the, as there was in BIMA. And in, uh, as I mentioned, I mean, this does allow us a window into a little bit of what happens after the uh, incentives are unbundled from the, the product itself. And uh, so I can show you a little bit of um, information on what happened after uh, the, they were no longer able to earn uh, rewards based on the MLM structure. Here's where we see a lot of similarities, right? The, the steps to success in this process were to get started, uh, you know, not uncommon to have this relatively low starting fee, in this case, $49. Advocare similarly had a low initial fee, but again, the imperative to get to advisor and pay that much larger amount. Same thing here, uh, right? Uh, success packs, uh, affiliate packs, uh, you know, that would really get you off on the right start. The monthly auto orders, which we're going to see, have a huge role in the success by health uh, structure here. But again, part of that is to is to create that blueprint. Uh, part of that is to be a product of the product, so that you can right um, discuss and with others uh, the 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 benefits of the product itself give out samples, things like that, um, and then straight to building a team, right? So we see the invest and build um, uh, pathway here, and again, duplicate, teach others to do the same. Um, the rewards here, I won't go through uh, in detail the analysis of the compensation plan, but I just want to highlight the role of recruitment here in some of the major rewards. So Success by Health was aggressive. They had a power of 10 structure, and that meant right? You're not supposed to get, you know, to succeed here, you know, you're really supposed to get 10 under you who will also get 10, who will also get 10. And so this was, I mean, uh, it was aggressive. Uh, and so we can see though, the, for example, one of the rewards was the tier commission um, and you could become, as Jay Nolan called it, a coffee millionaire. Mm -hmm. And, and what happened here was only every single person buying $500 a month of coffee, right? That's the only thing happening in this in this chart. Every single person's on that $500 auto order and uh, and you become a coffee millionaire, right? Um, but it gets 
it gets worse. Um, there's a, they had what are called BAM bonuses, $1 million, $5 million BAM bonuses. And so you would not just get the, the tier commissions that would come from that on a, on an ongoing basis, but you would also get large payouts, uh, a, a $5 million check, for example, if you were managed to build this downline structure of sufficient size. Um, and again, all that's happening here is a $500 monthly auto order. I mean, that is that is the only requirement is get everyone on the structure. Uh, in one consumer's words, uh, you know, what did this feel like from their perspective? You know, the focus was on recruiting, get 10 people, they would then get 10 more. And this was, I mean, the promise was residual income. Um, you might've seen recently, a, I think piece in the Washington Post about sort of the allure of residual income. Um, and, uh, you know, again, right? I mean, that was what they were told was going to free them um, from their jobs, uh, free them to, to, you know, right? Have, live out a higher order purpose in their life. Um, and in, in this consumer's words, that in six months, they would be able to walk away from their job. And again, that that was even encouraged to put their full selves into uh, the success by health business. Again, the combination of structure and misrepresentations, right? That um, if you get those tens, right? And get them doing a hundred or 500, you're gonna be a coffee millionaire and it's just a matter of work, right? Again, self-determination, um, and again, that the ultimate goal is this residual income, right? That, that frees you. Um, and this is the way to do it. It's your decision. Are you going to get free or are you not? <laughs> uh, very explicit about, again, self-determination in terms of three types of people, uh, supplemental income, walk away from your job or even better, right? Uh, yachts and so on. So, you know, again, it was really about, and, and the company argued uh, when, when, as you'll see the, the very poor outcomes, that people just didn't want two or three, they really just wanted one. Well, you know, unfortunately they didn't even get one, right? Um, so while that's not really, doesn't seem credible in my opinion, either way, it's, 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 it's not what happened. They didn't, they didn't, they lost money, right? They didn't get supplemental income. Um, and one of the things that I think uh, was a, a, some bit of a feature in the AdvoCare case was discussion of using credit. Um, if you weren't in a position to fund your investment, uh, and of course, again, this is not wholly unique, uh, that, um, that you know, credit could be used. And in fact, if you couldn't afford it, that was the very reason why you should be doing it, right? And in this case, um, uh, Mr. Nolan was very explicit about using other people's money um, and utilizing credit so that you could leverage other people's money. And in fact, even if you maybe had the money, right, you should be using other people's money um, because that was a way to like not even have to invest at all, right? You're, and, and then, uh, you know, uh, identifying that that that's what he did, and he turned it into multi billions of dollars in revenue. Mm -hmm. Outcomes uh, ninety eight point four percent paid in more than they received. This is of course just based on the expenses that were visible, um, you know, and that partly included some of these trainings that I was talking about, um, but also product expenditures. And so again, uh, incredibly high loss rate, um, even just with the data that was visible. Um, and again, losses of approximately $5 million. Again, the FTC um, uh, stopped, stepped in before I think additional losses could have been incurred. And uh, again, here we see uh, what happened after the temporary restraining order and the company was put into receivership. Um, the company tried to promote purchases as a way to save the firm. Like this is how you can show that this is a real company with real value just buy some product um, from the receiver and and really push that hard. And uh, despite that, only 3% of participants ever made a purchase, despite saying that they had a strong personal demand for the product, despite saying that some of them saying that they had retail customers for the product, um, didn't buy uh, after uh, the, the company went into receivership and they could no longer earn from the multi-level rewards. We're awaiting a court's final judgment. Um, we testified at trial in February of this year. Um, and so that is, of course, waiting daily to see what happens there. Um, and so I think that one of the things I just want to note in terms of, again, the, the similarities is that both that 
um, that we have to look at, again, the words on the page, the compensation plan, um, really, you know, again, analyze what people, of course, are being paid to do. Um, but also, again, where these, these operational practices and representations um, really tell, a, 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 you know, again, a richer picture of what's, of how this is brought to life. Um, and I mentioned that um, both cases give us some window into this unbundling um, of the opportunity from the products. Uh, you saw the numbers in terms of the, the share of distributors who ever bought from SBH after the TRO. Advocare, as I said, it's a little harder to get a read on their size, but um, one of the things that you can see now, they have a distributor website um, that has three regions. And one of the, there's, um, there's a discussion of like, that the first thing you should do if you're a new distributor is you should join one, your region's Facebook group. And it looks like in total, there's about 3,000 people um, in the, the region's total Facebook groups. Now, that's not a, necessarily, a, of course, a perfect representation of where they are, but this is a company that at one point had, uh, you know, nearly $800 million in annual sales. And so, you know, again, we, it gives us, again, an imperfect, but some indication of what happens when the multi-level piece uh, goes away. Thank you. Thank you. And place. okay, um, and now it's going to be my turn to uh, share a couple of cases. Uh, I need to make sure I've got myself ready to go here. Hang on. Um, uh, the title of my talk is uh, The Endless Harm of Endless Chain Recruitment. I'm gonna talk about a couple of cases um, and give some closing comments. The first case I'm gonna talk about is the Federal Trade Commission versus Thomas DeLuca et al., which was the Bitcoin funding team that morphed into My7 Network. Uh, this is a, two, a two settlement in 2018. Um, and I believe it is the FTC's first um, chain recruitment or chain referral crypto uh, case. Um, and then the second case I'm going to talk about, which is a little bit different in the sense it is a criminal case brought by the U.S. Attorney General's Office, Western District of Kentucky, um, against Richard Mikey et al. And the company was called Infinity to Global, um, and that, that actually morphed into Global One Entertainment, G1E. And then I'll give some closing comments about what I believe to be the politics of avoiding regulation and increased transparency. So Bitcoin funding team uh, was uh, purely a financial uh, scheme, uh, and it was all based on buying Bitcoin. Uh, at the time, Bitcoin was selling for about $1,000 a coin. Uh, and so uh, the premise here was to, to buy a 0.1 Bitcoin. Um, the overall message was uh, uh, one of success, financial success. If you want to be a millionaire within the next three to six months, get in here and you'll set your families for life and leave a legacy. There's also an element of sort of generosity or sharing called, uh, and they drew the analogy with crowdfunding um, uh, and they use a system in the scheme, which I will get to uh, called donations. Same time they positioned it as a type of business, a sort of crypto business in a box where the $100, that is the 0.1 Bitcoin could turn into 50, 60, 70, $80,000 a month. Uh, for an individual investment of 1.1 Bitcoin, a participant require, acquired the right to earn rewards from investments made by those they directly and indirectly recruit. Each participant P donates just one, and it's curious they use the word donate, they don't use the word invest, donates 0.1 Bitcoin, and it takes 842 participants to generate the potential of 84.2 Bitcoins in total payments received by P. That was the, that was the sort of holy grail. Uh, let me show you the uh, scheme itself. Um, so there are five levels. Um, and as we are well aware of in multi-level marketing structures, um, the compensation is structured in a way to keep people recruiting um, and uh, Dr. Vandernet and Dr. Baza both uh, 
uh, uh, describe that in their uh, experiences. So here, when you first recruit two people to each uh, donate 0.1 Bitcoin, you actually pass that up. You do not receive any of that. In order to stay eligible, you pass that up line. So at the end of recruiting two people, you're still down 0.1 Bitcoin. Uh, but as you progress to recruit and those you recruited recruit, you begin sharing in the sense that you donate some and you retain some. So at level two, you've retained 0.4 Bitcoin, so you're up 0.3. At level three, you retain 2.2. At level four, 14. And at level five, 64. The total, uh, it would be 80.6. You've uh, invested 0.1. So your net is 80.5 Bitcoins in return for an investment of 0.1 Bitcoin and 80,500% return, uh, which obviously um, would be attractive if in fact it could be realized. Bitcoin presented the scheme as a facilitating platform, not a company. Uh, their position was that they have created something that allowed people to attract others to this donation retention scheme. They also minimize the self-interest of the founders and the top participants. Quote, this, this is teams of people helping you. They don't get paid. They're not getting paid for this. Of course, they are making money on this. And then in the transition, um, what happened is after a while, Bitcoin funding team had gotten some critical notice. Uh, they then transitioned the company into what was called My7 Network. But what we want to do is really get you seeing how you can become a crypto, become crypto millionaires next year within 2018. And if not one crypto millionaire, a multi crypto millionaire. So lots of promise here. Um, and of course, uh, unfulfilled. Uh, but this is the structure uh, of um, my seven network. And I think it's important here. Uh, because what they used is they used a, a series of matrices. And so you would go in and you'd fill up matrices and then you'd go to the next matrices and the next matrices. And so uh, an unusual structure, I think, relative to what we're used to seeing in terms of sort of gifting clubs and, and things like that. And again, this is purely financial, uh, but even when they switched over to my seven network, you'll notice at the bottom right uh, that in fact, they were touting approximately the same return, 78,999% return from your initial investment. And also, just to point out, you'll notice that this is actually a mix of a Litecoin and Bitcoin. Um, the Federal Trade Commission uh, stepped in and invited me to participate uh, in this. Um, I estimated the percent of participants in a lost position based on the structure to be 87.5%. Uh, they actually brought, they got that, this is prior to having the actual data. Um, they brought in the actual data, hired some forensic accountants, and uh, the actual losses were 82% with 1.5% of break even. Uh, when I got into the data and talked with the um, uh, accountants, I, I learned that uh, there were numerous participants that maintained multiple positions, which would then account for a lower number of unique participants. Um, the FTC uh, issued refunds to 7,964 victims, and the defendants were barred from working in the MLM industry. And one of the things I want to point out here, because I think uh, when we talk about um, pure financial pyramid schemes, um, uh, sometimes called gifting clubs, we act as if they're very different from, say, a product-based multi-level marketing company. And I want to point out to the similarities. First of all, they each sustained Primarily, they each sustained primarily by endless chain recruitment and ongoing participant losses. There's an emphasis on wealth creation and financial freedom. Uh, recruitment is affinity based. Uh, uplines provide support seemingly free of self interest, which of course is inaccurate. There's always an element of helping others. In the Bitcoin case, it's, it's designated donations uh, in multi-level marketing company, product-based multi-level marketing companies. There's almost a charitable, almost always a charitable element. Outlier examples of financial winners belies the high percentage in a lost position. 
A uh, vast majority of participants are per perpetually in a lost position. Uh, this is similar to what uh, Dr. Vandernet was talking about. Uh, it's impossible to estimate your probability of success. And top participants persist as downline participants churn. So although we may think of product-based MLMs as very different from the financial pyramid schemes um, that we have seen, especially the simple gifting clubs, there are a number of similarities that at least struck me as I was looking at a uh, Bitcoin funding team. The second um, case I wanna talk about is Infinity to Global. This case was just um, uh, 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 prosecuted um, in the summer and fall of 2022. Again, we see these, these messages. We are, we are now earning with what would be the top 1% network marketers in the whole world. 70 people on our team that have earned five figures in a monthly period inside of four months with a total of 6,000 distributors. The product, the I2G Touch, uh, which I will describe in a minute, took eight years to create for $20 million and it currently has a product valuation of $200 million. But success is all dependent on you, just as uh, Dr. Baza was describing in her case. Uh, ironically, if you're an emperor, um, it isn't. All dependent on you. Uh, if you are at the emperor level, you don't even have to sponsor anybody. It is a passive position that anybody can come in and share in the pool of casino royalties equally for one year each and every month. So let me get a little bit into the company and the product. The company was founded by Richie Mikey, um, who had had two years in the MLM industry. He was the founder of Healing America, which I believe is now part of Longevity. Um, he had uh, worked to develop a product um, uh, with a um, software developer called I2G Touch. It's a social media aggregation and communication software. Now, to give you a time frame on this, this is, uh, this is 2013. Um, in addition to that, the company contracted with an offshore uh, casino um, uh, located in Cyprus. And uh, the deal with the casino was simply that if we funnel uh, people willing to place bets through our portal into your casino, can we share some of the profits of the people that we brought to you? Um, so uh, I suspect these kinds of deals are not at all unusual. Um, so offshore betting through the I2G casino portal would theoretically create profits to be shared with the emperors only the emperors. Um, and then the company also promoted the fact that they had forthcoming products and they had created here uh, what I called a nested MLM structure. So first of all, uh, this is the overall view of the company. They are a global online entertainment company. They offer online gambling. They offer social media technology. Uh, gambling is, is described as a multi-trillion dollar industry or the entertainment industry plus gambling. Um, they were, had developed a music uh, online music app, and they were had uh, talked about products in phases two and three, and in, by phase four, they hope to open uh, land-based resorts. The primary product that was introduced was the I2G. Um, I2G was an aggregation software, so your different social media would feed into it, uh, connect anytime, any place, real-time access to multiple platforms. It had an assertive communication, meaning it had a network of a communication network that was uh, within the, the members themselves who were part of the ITG network. Um, and so they you know, characterized this as one tool to rule them all. Um, interestingly, this exact same software was available free on the internet. <laughs> it just didn't have this labeling on it. So the nested uh, structure was the top were emperors. It was a, a top tier participants. It was a $5,000 buy-in. For the first year, there was forbearance on any auto ship. Um, the number of emperors were limited to 5,000. Uh, they would receive higher earnings percent on those they recruited. Uh, and they were eligible for a share of I2G profits from offshore casino. Um, then there was uh, uh, three tiers of non-emperors, uh, they were novice player, high roller based on buying amount. They could 
uh, th uh, through recruitment, move up the ranks, um, uh, but they could not move up the ranks through recruitment to the emperor position. The emperor position required the 5,000 buy-in. They could join at a novice supply player rate and then pay the difference to become an emperor if they cared to do so. Uh, it was a one-time purchase plus an annual fee and ongoing auto shipments uh, in order to maintain eligibility. And the curious thing here is uh, the auto shipment, because we're really not talking about a product that's being sold to the to non-participants uh, at all. Um, so if you if you generated enough business volume through recruitment, that would satisfy your audit shipment requirement. If you did not, you just simply paid money to maintain your eligibility. This is uh, their depiction of the structure. I won't go into the whole detail, but you see you can see in each case they're promoting the fact that you could. Uh, uh, potentially uh, earn up to $5,000 a day uh, based on what they call business volume or BV. Uh, this uh, shows you uh, that they use what they call a binary income cycle. Um, and so once you generated uh, 600 BV, uh, 300 on each leg of your binary structure, that would be constitute a income cycle and it would generate the amounts uh, depending on your level of buy-in that you see on the right. So emperors would get twice as much as novices. In less than two years, the downlines reached level 273. Um, and I'm sure for those of you who are familiar with this binary um, and exponential, exponential growth, at level 33, you exceed the population of the world. Um, so what we saw with 273 levels are these very leggy kinds of downlines that were mostly incomplete. Um, uh, some of the characteristics of the structure were that unbeknownst to the public and unbeknownst to other participants, uh, except high level participants, there were positions called customer in the data they were called customer. They cost just $20. And when you bought that position, you maintain that position uh, and you were this is only open to the high level um, uh, participants. The, what it was was a reserved slot. So that if sometime in the future, they identified um, a participant who had a track record of recruitment, they could place that participant in this desired position in the structure. And so uh, there was a fairly interesting give and take during the trial from a, a witness, a defense witness, who had invested by buying multiple kinds of uh, multiple, multiple emperor positions. Um, and he was unaware of the fact that he could have secured positions, some of those positions for just $20 instead of $5,000. Uh, the top, the other th part of the structure that was unknown and even known, unknown to top participants was that the top three levels were owned by Mikey. So he was funneling off money uh, at the top uh, every time somebody made money. Um, and in terms of the off off offshore casino contract, um, although there were a couple of months that were net positive, um, because they had to pay a monthly fee to the casino to maintain the relationship. In fact, uh, during the period, um, there was a net financial loss for I2G. Um, the, the participants openly discussed um, the possibility of recruiting um, downlines from other MLM companies and then placing them in the structure. Uh, in the end, um, uh, based on the gain loss data, we had 96.5% were in a lost position. Um, and although in a very short time, less than two years, uh, about 18 months or so, they had brought in about 30 million in revenue. Um, at the time of the trial, they had recovered only 18 million. Um, but sentencing um, was in the fall of 2022. Uh, Richard Mikey got 10 years. Uh, Doyce Barnes got four years. Uh, and Faraday, who, who sent a poor, she got 18 months. And there are two defendants still in the settlement process. Here too, I wanna to make a comparison um, because uh, uh, although um, uh, and sometimes we hear uh, that uh, the schemes that are, have, have sub are subject to criminal prosecution are somehow different than schemes that aren't. There are certainly some similarities. 
um, comparing to say VEMA and Advocare, we have participants purchasing the right to be eligible for earnings based on purchases by those they directly or indirectly recruit. We have ongoing participant purchases, either product purchases or auto ship required to maintain eligibility for earnings. There's no apparent consumer demand for product independent of the participant purchases. There's an ongoing emphasis of wealth creation and financial freedom. And there's information asymmetry that hides actual upline and downline structures and opportunities. So in general, uh, I wanna point out just some characteristics that we've seen that are very common across the industry, opaque recruitment and earnings, chronic misleading product and earnings statements, chronic asymmetric information, top earners persist with downline churn, retention efforts are baked in as, as important as recruitment, retention keeps people buying and trying, and, and that generates profits and rewards upline. We have a high percentage consistently in a financial loss position, the industry pr promotes the wealth, or the, sorry, the myth of self-regulation. And our keynote speaker last year, uh, Bonnie Patton from uh, uh, Tina.org, uh, presented data that supports that, in fact, that this notion of self-regulation that the industry has been promoted literally for decades is, in fact, a myth and continues to be a myth. And then, of course, we have industry leaders, which I found is interesting, uh, spending a great deal of money to try to resist regulatory oversight. And just get a couple of, uh, of charts for that real quick. Using opensecrets.org and Macro 10's data and some news articles, what I'm, I'm showing here are the political donations um, by three MLM companies and three non-MLM companies who are more or less leaders in their industry. So the three MLM companies are Primerica, uh, Amway, and Melaleuca, and the three non-MLM companies are Meta, Pfizer, and Goldman Sachs. Uh, so what we see here is the amount of, of annual, or the amount of annual, meaning for that year, that election year, the amount of, for that year uh, of, in political contributions as a percent of revenue. So of course, Melaleuca sticks out, uh, and you'll notice that in 2012, 2014, we're seeing some, some comparable um, say, uh, efforts uh, 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 be between non-MLM and MLM companies. By 2016, the MLM companies as a percentage of revenue are spending more on their political contributions. And by that, we're talking about what the Open Secrets calls, calls company affiliates. These are the organization's PACs their individual members or employees or owners, and those individuals' immediate family members. Uh, this is the definition of open secrets, not mine. Uh, by 2018, you see uh, the MLM uh, companies uh, spending considerably more, in a, a, again, in 2020. Now, the other way, of course, that companies try to influence public policy is through lobbying, which would be uh, something that is a public activity that's reported, um, and so when, and, and also tracked by Open Secrets. So when we add in lobbying, uh, what we see here is Primerica jumps out as spending a fair amount on lobbying as a percentage of revenue. Um, and we see um, uh, in the early years, Meta um, as a percentage of its revenue uh, spending um, a fair amount. Uh, but again, by 2016, we're seeing MLM companies uh, uh, lobbying and uh, this is lobbying and political contributions combined. They're lobbying and political contributions combined, eclipsing the uh, rather well-known and, and uh, leading companies in their own respective industries, um, both in 2016, 2018, and 2020. Um, now, obviously, Meta and Pfizer and Goldman Sachs are large companies, but they are also heavily regulated companies. The, their industries face a, a range of, of a regulatory um, uh, constraints or possible constraints. Uh, so here we're talking about uh, an industry, the MLM industry, which constitutes less than 1% of US retail trade, um, spending money in, in ways that I think that they think does them some good. Thank you. Now, um, Blair Wack from the FTC. Um, hello, I'm Claire Wack. I'm happy to be here uh, speaking with everyone. Um, 
At the outset, I just want to make clear that the views I express today are my opinions and are not necessarily representative of the views of the commission or any one commissioner. Um, today, I'm going to be providing an overview um, on some recent enforcement matters and updates on those matters. Um, but I think it is helpful to start off with an understanding of what constitutes a pyramid scheme under FTC law. Um, you know, Dr. Bosley and Bill were both discussing um, some FTC cases, and ultimately the, the law is what is underpinning the commission's ability to bring those cases. So um, section five of the FTC Act is the bread and butter of the commission's consumer protection work. Um, and it's ultimately what prohibits pyramid schemes. Um, it prohibits unfair and deceptive acts or practices. So uh, in 19, there was a 1975 case brought by the FTC. I'm sure many of you are familiar with it. Um, in administrative court, it was against a cosmetic company called Coscott Interplanetary. And the commission held that uh, the MLM was operating in a deceptive manner by operation of a pyramid scheme. And the commission described the pyramid scheme as uh, pyramids are characterized by payment of money by participants to the company in return for which the participant receives first the right to, re to sell a product or service and second, the right to receive rewards unrelated to the sale of that product or service to ultimate users in return for recruiting other participants into the program. Um, the FTC has a long history of enforcing against pyramid schemes, um, and there are numerous other decisions um, from FTC cases that have built on Coscott. Um, two that I've included here are Burn Lounge and Vima, which have both been mentioned. Uh, Burn Lounge, uh, the court stated that an illegal pyramid scheme can exist even if rewards are not completely unrelated to the sale of to product sales, um, and then Vima. Uh, in the Vima case, the court uh, said that the second cost cut prong is the sin qua non of a pyramid scheme because that right to receive rewards unrelated to the sale of a product or service um, to ultimate users in return for recruiting uh, tends to induce participants to focus on the recruitment side of the business at the expense of retail marketing efforts. Um, the Vima court also stated that a program that allows MLM participants to consume pro some products is not a per se pyramid scheme, so it's not automatically a pyramid scheme, but evidence that distributors purchase and consume product for the purpose of qualifying for recruitment incentives is evidence of a pyramid scheme. So I'm going to uh, move to the uh, enforcement updates, and some of this was covered by Dr. Bosley um, down to the screen. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, so as Dr. Bosley mentioned, yes, we had a settlement with Advocare in October of 2019. Um, it required the company to immediately end the pyramid scheme, but also it included a ban on all future multi-level marketing and $150 million for redress uh, for consumers in redress. So since then, um, $149.9 million or $0.49 million have been mailed out in checks. Um, 134 of that has been uh, cashed. Uh, there's $12 million in checks that have been mailed that are still waiting cashing, um, but there have been 224,000 uh, recipients with a median refund of $509. Um, this data is uh, available on public Tableau, which um, uses data from the FTC Sentinel network um, to uh, visually uh, display um, a, num a lot of really interesting uh, information about various FTC cases. It's all public. So um, if you're curious, you can search by case. Um, but it's something that uh, is fun to click around and you can look at a number of um, the cases that um, the FTC has worked on. The next case I'm going to mention is FTC v. Neora. Um, so the FTC had a settlement with Signum Biosciences and Signum Neutrologics in 2019 
but we have ongoing litigation with Neora LLC, which is also known as, uh, was formerly known as Nerium, and it's Principal Jeffrey Olson. So the trial took place October 17th to the 25th of 2022. Um, the complaint alleges illegal pyramid schemes, false earnings claims, uh, false or unsubstantiated product efficacy claims and establishment claims, um, and providing the means and instrumentalities to deceive with promotion and marketing materials. Um, so that is um, providing those, the marketing materials effectively to the distributors who then go forth and uh, make the unlawful claims as well. Um, so we're waiting on the um, court's decision in that matter. Um, uh, the next case I'll cover is the FTC and the state of Arkansas, uh, the Bint Operations LLC. Uh, BINT stands for Blessings in No Time. Um, so in June 2021, the FTC and Arkansas AG sued BINT and its operators for, among other things, uh, running a chain referral pyramid scheme called a blessing loom. Um, this differs from the Costco MLM pyramid in that it's a pure money transfer scheme uh, with no product or service obstructing the view of the unlawful structure. Um, the FTC in this case also alleged that Bint was unfairly uh, restricting the publishing of truthful commentary by threatening or intimidating members from speaking or publishing truthful, non-defamatory negative comments and reviews about Bint and its operation. Um, Bint often required consumers to agree to Bint's prohibition against posting on social media and the internet as a prerequisite for joining the program. And the FTC alleged that that's an unfair practice, uh, which means that it caused or is likely to cause substantial injury to consumers that is not reasonably avoidable and that is not outweighed by countervailing benefits to consumers or con uh, competition. Uh, the next case, FTC v. James Nolan, which Dr. Bosley also covered, um, in June 2020, uh, a federal court granted the FTC's request to temporarily shut down uh, this pyramid scheme uh, or alleged pyramid scheme. Um, as Dr. Bosley said, Jay Noland uh, was under a previous order with the FTC. So we also alleged um, or brought a contempt action um, alleging violations of that 2002 order, which banned him from operating pyramid schemes. Um, there was a, uh, 2021 order finding for the FTC, uh, on our motion for summary judgment. And that order found the individual defendants liable for the pyramid scheme. And that Vaz travel, uh, was also a pyramid screen scheme as well as, um, false income claims and multiple rule violations. And the trial took place earlier this year, January 25th to February 8th. So we are also awaiting um, a decision in that case. Another case uh, that is currently in litigation is the FTC versus Financial Education Services. Um, the FTC charged FES, its owners, um, and related companies with scamming more than $213 million from consumers. Um, FES is a credit repair company uh, that also operates in an MLM structure. Um, and we alleged that the company was preying on both English and Spanish speaking consumers. So they were, you know, targeting their advertisements in both English and Spanish. Um, we alleged uh, deception regarding the credit repair services. Um, also that they sold ineffective rent payment products, uh, that they were charging consumers upfront for credit repair and that they were operating a pyramid scheme. Um, that company was uh, temporarily shut down through a TRO. Um, it was then switched to a receiver um, and litigation continues. And then lastly, uh, the FTC recently announced settlement with doTERRA uh, distributors, three doTERRA distributors. Um, this case was brought by the DOJ on the FTC's behalf 
um, just something that happens where we allege rule violations. Um, so for this case, um, we, the FTC uh, sued three wellness advocates uh, from doTERRA, which is Utah-based MLM. Um, and they have agreed, we've settled the case and they've agreed to stop making unfounded COVID claims. They were claiming that their products uh, would treat, cure, or prevent COVID-19. Um, additionally, the orders require them to back up any health claims. Um, you have to have reliable human clinical testing to support claims about diseases um, in addition to any COVID claims that they may make. Um, so this will have hopefully forward uh, looking, uh, make a forward looking difference as um, COVID is you know, receding a bit. Um, and then each of the wellness advocates uh, has to pay a $15,000 financial penalty. That's 